In today's video, I discuss the only type of fasting that I will do in 2020 and beyond. Roll the titles. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Before I jump into the video, just a quick reminder that I'm now offering the SIBO organic acid stool tests and consult via my website. So if you have any health or digestive problems, then consider taking these tests as they will provide a lot of very detailed information upon which you can start making informed decisions and then start getting your health back on track. And on that bombshell, to the video. So the problem with the term intermittent fasting is that it has become a blanket term for all things fasting related. So before we delve into what form of fasting I believe is generally optimal for humans, I first want to differentiate between the different types. So intermittent fasting in humans, according to the science, is generally considered anything up to 24 to 48 hours, and prolonged fasting is considered anything over the 48 hour mark. In addition to intermittent fasting and prolonged fasting, you also have time-restricted feeding, which definitely has an intermittent fasting element to it, but it also has the circadian rhythm component to it as well. And this circadian rhythm component essentially involves eating when your metabolism is operating at its peak during the day, and when you are not eating, you are obviously fasting. So typically for those following time-restricted feeding patterns, they will fast for 16 hours a day, and this has become known as the 16-8 fasting. Now with the time-restricted feeding approach, you get all of the benefits from the intermittent fasting, such as repair processes being activated in order to repair any damage done in your body. So typical damage could be damage to your DNA, damage to proteins, or even damage to your mitochondria, which are the little power plants in the cells that produce the energy currency that your body runs on. So all of this damage and debris that is floating through your body is removed and repaired while your body is in this fasting state. In addition to the fasting component, the time-restricted feeding approach has the added benefit of eating within your circadian biology. So if you think about it, all animals in nature have a biological daily clock that determines when they eat and when they sleep and humans are no different. Animals don't need a watch to tell them what time it is, it is an inbuilt call to action. So you are eating within your body's inbuilt circadian rhythms when your metabolism is at its optimal levels throughout the day. So if you're eating your breakfast at say 7 a.m. in the morning, then you don't want to be eating your evening meal after 8 p.m. You will have exceeded a intermittent component of 16 hours fasting and then an eight hours of eating, and your metabolism at 8 p.m. in the evening is really not gonna be great at all. As a result of eating this late, you are probably not gonna be particularly insulin sensitive, and your blood glucose levels will also be significantly elevated. In addition to glucose and insulin issues, your fatty acid metabolism at 8 p.m. in the evening is also not going to be particularly great, so you will end up storing many of these fatty acids as fat in the body instead of utilizing them for energy. Also, there is evidence to suggest that when people eat later in the evening, their bodies can be tricked into thinking it's the first meal of the day, and then essentially it triggers a metabolism reset. So your body's circadian clock can be reset into thinking that your evening meal is the first meal of the day, and as a result, while you are sleeping, your metabolism is operating superbly, and then when you wake up in the morning, it's running very slow when you load up on breakfast. And this is why many people wake up in the morning very fatigued. And when this misalignment happens, your circadian biological clock is all over the place, meaning that your blood glucose levels are always high, and the fatty acids that you consume in your diet are more likely to be stored as fat. So that is intermittent fasting and time-restricted feeding. Now, prolonged feeding, as I said earlier, is anything over 48 hours in duration. Now, prolonged fasting is absolutely something you should be doing under medical supervision, as there are all sorts of complications that can occur if it's done incorrectly. In humans, there is not a lot of scientific evidence on the benefits of prolonged fasting. It is more anecdotal in nature. But there are a lot of animal studies, and don't get me started with that, that show there are significant benefits of autophagy when carrying out prolonged fasting. So autophagy is simply the clearing out process that the body uses to clear out debris and toxins from inside your cells, as well as actually removing damaged cells themselves. In these animal studies, it has also been shown that prolonged fasting, which activates autophagy, 
also activates the release of stem cells and also replenishes dying cells with healthy new ones. Now in humans, despite what you hear on social media, there is no real evidence to support prolonged fasting in the body in terms of its impacts on autophagy, stem cell release, and also cell replenishment. Now don't get me wrong, in certain people with life debilitating diseases, trying prolonged fasting based on anecdotal evidence may be worth a risk for some of these people. But for those who are simply looking to incorporate fasting benefits such as autophagy and stem cell production into their daily lives, then prolonged fasting is probably something that I would avoid at all costs. So for example, if you do a Tim Sheaf with digestive issues and then do a prolonged fast, you can wipe out what microbiome you have in place and then your digestive issues will really crank up in intensity as you don't have the ability to break down the fiber and compounds within foods correctly. Now there are various iterations of intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding and prolonged fasting, but these are the three fasting types that have the most research surrounding them. Now for me, intermittent fasting is great if done correctly, so something like a 16-hour fast followed by an eight-hour eating window. Prolonged fasting is extreme and I certainly don't recommend this. On top of this, the vast majority of benefits seen in prolonged fasting in animal studies, such as stem cell production, are actually achievable by following time-restricted feeding approaches without having to starve yourself for days on end. Now, in terms of inducing autophagy, you can do a 48-hour fast, which is something that I do a couple of times a year to reset but you don't want to go too much longer than 48 hours unless under the supervision of someone who knows what they are doing. So if you are someone who wants to get the benefits of fasting into your life, then I would highly recommend looking into time-restricted feeding and eating in alignment with your body's circadian rhythm. And there is a decent amount of evidence to support this. And this is something that I do on a daily basis. So I eat breakfast around 8 a.m. and then I consume my last meal between 4 and 5 p.m. And during these hours, I know that my metabolism is firing on all cylinders. Fasting can be extremely beneficial if done correctly, but can also be very destructive if done incorrectly. So don't send your body to extremes. So that's the end of today's video. I hope you all enjoyed. And as always, remember to look after your body because it's the only place you have to live. And I'll see you next time.